What up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Uh, we got a fantastic show for you today. A lot of great uh, topics, a lot of interesting news that recently came out. Uh, but before we get into that, we'd like to um, ask everyone for their support and just hitting that like, um, like button, that subscription, um, that notification bell, and share it with your friends. It really helps support the channel. Brian, what's going on? Not much, man. I'm calling the shot. This is going to be our best show. We are mixing all of our version of Chaos Magic. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay. WandaVision. Oh, man. Episode eight. And I am going to say it right now. I called it. I think I said it in the last episode where I said that we're probably going to go back to how this all began. And man, they, they did not disappoint. Uh, we are so much more well-informed and still yet have questions. Uh, Brian, and it's crazy. I spoke to a, a Freddie, Freddie Maloney from Brooklyn. And uh, he said the same thing that I said, that this is, or this was perhaps one of the best episodes, no action. Just a lot of going back and talking, taking us back to conversations that were had in previous films. And it was just one of the best episodes uh, of the series so far. Tell me what you think. I texted you after and I said, I was blown away. I thought this was one of the, if you're a fan of comic books, I can't think of another 45 minutes of television or film that lifted so many great classic things straight from a comic right onto this. And it didn't mess with it, didn't change. It. We talked about that last week too, how Marvel changes a lot of things, but at its core, like some of the really big famous things, they do not mess around. And they gave so many of those to us in this one episode. I, I love the format to your point, you know, it wound up being a great choice to order this series the way they did, where they kind of dropped us in the middle of it. And then we got the whole rewind and flashback and, you know, Elizabeth Olsen and Catherine Hahn really got the flex in this episode, but, you know, and then throughout. And man, I, I just, even though some of the choices and the outcomes seem a little different than maybe we were anticipating, I felt very rewarded that these were classic choices from the mythology. And I, yes. I mean, the finale and the and the where we could be headed to in Doc Strange two is just insane at this point. I was so excited, I almost ruined it for you. I was like, "Oh, Brian, yo, I can't believe!" And I'm like, "Oh, snap! This dude hasn't seen it yet. Let me chill. Let me chill." It, this 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 episode, man. Let's get into it a little bit. Yes. One of the questions I have, and most people seem to agree that, um, Wanda had this ability before the stones, which leads me to believe that many others have some type of ability got it. Um, before, shall I say, the snap. We will get, I guess, the origin of where this mutant or gene uh, that gives them these abilities most likely in Eternals and we'll get that we'll get into that a little bit later yep. um, but it was just so interesting to see that occur because when I was watching I was like oh snap she has this even before do you think exposure yeah so okay so let's go back to age of ultron for a second do you think as far back as then this was a deliberate choice not to give us the true origin of the maximoffs just in case they got the rights to x-men and like because had they given us a full backstory then they'd have been boxed in a little bit yeah. with this show and because it was open-ended they were able to show us her as a mutant or a first generation mutant. And it felt really natural and seamless and was really consistent with the comics. Do you think it was a deliberate choice dating back like six years? 
Of course. Of course. I think so. I mean, I, it, even if it wasn't, they surely did a hell of a job writing that in and and, and showing that piece to us to say, aha, uh -huh, mutant, mutants do exist and this is how they're going about it. And obviously we're going to get some more insight into that with other films in the future, but it's going to be very interesting to see other individuals who show this ability uh, prior to any uh, snap. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they develop this. I, for sure, for sure. Um, what were your thoughts or, how did, or what were your feelings when the words, the Scarlet Witch finally, because this is the first time we ever hear that. For many people well, who don't was, know, yeah. Man, it was a buildup to it because, you know, even though Darcy had, so when Darcy called Westview the Hex, I don't think that was lost on anyone who knew Scarlet Witch, right? But, but it almost felt like a joke because Darcy's a comic character and Marvel likes to put Easter eggs that don't necessarily go to big places in there. Yeah. But in this episode, when she was reliving the moment with the Stark Industries bomb and she starts moving her hand and Agatha says, you you pull the probability hex. I was immediately just like my radar <laughs> was up because I was like, OK, the buzzwords are coming out. And then she goes to the speech at the end with chaos magic and then calling her the Scarlet Witch. And I'm like, oh, wow, like we really went all the way down that path. Yeah unbelievable moment and i think a huge payoff for you know quite honestly a character that in the mcu you know never felt like a mainline character and then to see this was the episode where i felt like elizabeth olsen went from being like okay i'm having fun with this character to oh i think you know if you want to build a film and this really felt like part of a film not a yeah, tv yeah, show yeah 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 if you want to carry her into doc strange 2 and make her sort of a, a villain which is definitely a path from the comics that is linked to what the, they did in this show absolutely she could anchor that i bet this was like for her probably the payoff of playing this character i thought she was amazing in this episode reliving her life like that so yeah yeah huge huge just like goosebumps when that got definitely <laughs> definitely yeah um, what was cool about watching this episode and, and it sort of gave us some, a, a reveal actually of Haywood lying about, mm -hmm. um, Wanda taking Vision's body. So we finally know that the vision that is in the hex is not the vision that was left out in the field with the, the, the stone ripped from his head. Uh, I was, I had to watch a few videos to sort of figure out um, what the end game was for Haywood. And it was to revive this um, broken right. robot, let's say, and uh, and he was sort of baiting her. He wanted her to do or to provide some sort of energy to do something to bring it back. Mm -hmm. And he finally got his wish. So it's going to be very interesting to see. I mean, Wanda's going to be messed up after this. 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 Uh... I think she's going to be a villain. You think? I think that's. I think she. I think. I think the arc. If you believe the comics. This sequence of events is the catalyst for her and Agatha sort of working together, like her kind of accepting Agatha as a mentor. And of course, we'll get to Thawne and the book, and there's that other element too of possession. But in the comics, this arc led her down a path of being a villain for a while. And she yeah. ultimately get and and the other piece of that is is the other vision that winds up being a huge catalyst for her kind of leaving the team and coming you know into a dark place and ultimately mm. having to be rescued so yeah no the the scene with vision on the table is straight out of a comic i actually went and looked it's like from the 80s or whatever there's literally that shot of him on the table her standing there um and it's it 
is a precursor to him becoming becoming Got white it. vision mm -hmm. so yeah no i i think it's definitely being set up for her to basically lose her grasp on reality and become an opponent of doc strange or somebody on, on the avengers team it'll be interesting to see where that leads in, the, in doctor strange too how that relationship or that encounter is sort of uh, um played how it plays out well, you know what um agatha's part in this reminded me of a episode of the batman animated series where the rilla is going crazy at the end of the episode he's going crazy trying to figure out how the hell did batman do this or find out this or how did he find out the the answer to this or whatever so agatha throughout this whole thing was just trying to figure out how is she doing this so it, yeah it does definitely lead to agatha sort of mentoring her because i believe she realizes that she doesn't really know how she's doing it she's just doing it and she's going to sort of guide her into how to really fully use her powers well, i love this i love the interplay in this episode because it was like elizabeth olsen playing it really straight really dramatic it was hard not to really get emotionally invested i'm like man you had to relive moments like that in your life that would be yeah. tough yeah but then on the flip side you have Catherine hahn who's just like i'm gonna ham this up i'm gonna abs like this is why i took this part like i'm yeah. gonna just chew on every scene and yeah, you yeah, know yeah. max out the the sort of the mix of playful sinister and ultimately villainous payoff but to your point she's not in the loop all the way you can see like she's trying to do some detective work and we can still see there's another entity that's not fully spoken for or revealed yet we probably yeah. get more of a tease next week but there is a third piece of this equation and um yeah no i think it stays very true to this idea of like agatha manipulates wanda but then mm -hmm. there's we thought it was going to be mephisto it's looking a little less likely i would say that it's going to be him in this series at least but but it still seems like there's clues to a third party. Um, it's quite possible that we may sort of get a, a similar introduction of how we got Thanos at the end of Avengers and may get Mephisto at the end of this, the, the, the cutscene. It is quite possible that we may get that. Because to introduce him, let's say, midway through this and then having him get defeated, which I doubt, that'll happen because this story will continue in Doctor Strange 2. Uh, it'll probably take away a little bit from the entirety of the thing uh, of the whole thing. So I, I think as we've seen and Marvel has done, there is it's the, the exposition that it's, that that really it's works. The color arc, right? It's yeah. the cut like that's not an accident that they showed the book, which a lot of people are saying is the dark hold and it gave it a different color. So that tells you there's a different entity. Now, whether to your point, we get that in the episode, it's a stinger, something more hinted at than shown, you know there's something coming. That may be a doc strange. Some people have said, you know, hey, the the um the ancient one and sort of all of her disciples seem to use orange as their color. And I was trying to think, like, is it that orange or is it more like yellow, like in in, in some of their films? But that's been pointed out the parallels there. Um, but I think clearly this is setting up a force that we probably will get linked to Doc Strange 2 with. And if it is Thon, Thon is another entity, an elder god who controlled Wanda multiple times in the comics. And so if we're starting to even look at multiverse stuff, he's part of the multiverse. He gets banished to another earth and then he comes back. So a lot of potential there that makes some sense and Mephisto also operates and uses the dark hole book at points so they left the door yeah. open for really both of those characters to to be a part of this um how do you feel about I think I, I do want to <laughs> how do you feel about the fact that it does feel like now there was a little bit of a systemic wink by these cast members at all of us, getting us to kind of play around with all these fun theories when they kind of were maybe not what we thought. Like, I think we now kind of know Paul Bettany's comment is about himself, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what people have been saying. 
Um, I mean, I, hey, again, we're here talking about this being one of the best episodes. Um, so it really doesn't bother me. It's just that, you know, it gives you a, a slight chuckle. And, and it, it makes you even like Bethany a little bit more for, for, for playing with us, you know? Yeah. Uh, we still haven't gotten the aerospace engineer. Is he even, do we even care now? I mean- Now there's people saying, was it the person, was it the woman in military gear who gave her the rover? Like, I don't know. Um, yeah. You know, Paris is kind of talking, it seems to be talking every which way about it. Um, you know, the other angle here I wanted to ask you about is, do you buy into this idea that the scrolls are in this series somewhere, that they're leaving doors open to kind of change some of these characters, whether it's Hayward, whether it's um, someone else, into those later as part of Secret Invasion? It is quite possible. Um, I, I have, there hasn't been any real clear indication of that. No, I wouldn't say. Um, it wouldn't surprise me, but we don't know the other characters so well enough to be like surprised if there are i would be more surprised if it's a character that we know that turns out to be a scroll right that would be the surprising part of it that's fair yeah um what was interesting also that people are, are commenting about monica rambeau possibly as well having that that mutant gene um even prior to hook to her going back into the hex because there are a few shots where for example in the prior episode when she gets into the machine and and the machine tries to go through and she comes out of it she like sort of rips the the top off mm -hmm. you gotta if you watch it and, and you watch that that scene again she rips the top off um so that shows some sort of level of strength there and her dealings in the past People are saying that it's possible that um, her mom got the cancer from Captain Marvel and her energy being um, around her. And hence her, because this obviously there is a sort of ill feeling towards her whenever her name is mentioned. So there's a lot that is to look forward to in, in, in this. Well, to your point, remember, Monica Rambo also is at the center of that sequence that we talked about in a couple episodes ago where Darcy says, Hayward's got your blood. Like, I remember they, they wanted to focus on that. Like Hayward's got your blood. And then they showed like the molecular change at like multi, and we were led to, Darcy was led to think it's because of the hex, but I'm telling you the way that was framed out, it's the only character where they said, there's definitely like a trail there that could lead to some other place. I think Hayward is going to be a part of this next phase for quite some time. He's I not agree. going to disappear. Yeah, I agree. Um, anything else you want to discuss uh, 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 from this? Uh, My well, unanswered questions for mm -hmm. you. I still, so when we saw the inside the hex vision being created out of one, it, it still did not answer for me the question I had for you last week, which is how is that vision able to perceive, grow, think, and question for himself? That he's the only person inside the hex able to do that. And yet he's True. shown as a creation of Wanda just like the rest of the world. I think that's a question they have to, it can't be a mistake, it can't be an accident. So Yeah, that is very interesting. That is very interesting. That she, I mean, I think she knows his whereabouts, right? But yeah, it, it, it's, that's a tough one. That's a good one. I, it'll be interesting to see how they explain that. Because then in this episode, they showed her touching the actual vision's head. And she says, I can't feel you, which was sort of a sign of like, hey, whatever mind stone energy he used to have is not there. But he acts inside the hex like he's still connected to something on the outside. That's that's why to me it seems there's a piece missing that we might get when the maybe the two visions come head to head, which we clearly are going to see. Yeah. Um, and uh, and like I said, in the comics, White Vision comes back as this true automaton, no emotional attachment, no loyalty to Wanda. He is a puppet of Sword, mm -hmm. and it it 
breaks her emotionally. Like I said, that's a big catalyst for her really losing her faith. And so yeah. I'm curious to see if, remember Teona Paris saying the ending of this was sad. I'm curious to see if that's a part of it. Yeah, yeah. Mo most likely, most likely. It'll be interesting to see what happens to the children too. Yeah. At the end of this. Yeah, because they were shown as being sort of real at the, like, you know, like they disappeared and then they came back. So I think we're being led to believe they do exist. You know, yeah. but obviously they came from Mephisto in part. So that's the other part of this. That, that, that's, yeah, that's the other part. Like you said, Marvel doesn't mess around too much with the history of the comics. And I doubt that they'll uh, separate those two uh, or that, that history that's, you know, known to be, that's where they came from. So let's see, let's see. There's still a lot of things to unravel, but so far what we've gotten has been fantastic, I'd say. Yeah, if you stuck with this show, I think you're feeling now, like that hour to me felt like it was on par with any non-action part of the MCU that we saw in the theater. And it was interesting, I was at a park today with my kid and there were, it was a group of like four or five girls, probably ages between nine and 13. And they were just on this swing set, down from us, all talking about WandaVision. That's all they were talking about. Hey, Says man. it all, man. Whoever has gotten off the train of Marvel is like, we can't have any conversations because it's like, how do you not look at this and be like, yo, this is fantastic, yo. What they're doing is fantastic, man. And no one can deny that. No one, no one, nobody can argue uh, the fact that this has you know, uh, really engaged people so much into watching Marvel. And I, I said, like I said before, I would like to see how much uh, people are watching the previous movies. Uh, and that leads even up to the next, because, you know, Falcon and the Winter Soldier is going to have a history that they probably might go back to, especially with the Winter Soldier. Cause you know, he ain't right. You know, so they, they, there's gonna be a lot of stuff going back to previous films and, and things that people have said and done. So it'll be interesting to me to see how much more people who weren't into the films or, or have never seen the films that have just started watching these shows are going back to go see, to go, I guess, educate themselves a bit on, on this. I'm, the, the other part of this, like we've talked about this for a long time, but I'm so, excited because marvel took a swing here this is different and it broke early on i was like mm, this might be a little <laughs> too different <laughs> but now they brought it back to to center but to your point this is not an action show this is a drama this is a very different style that they've gone with and so for the first show to be like we're go we're showing you there's new cards in our deck as we yeah. move forward that is the most exciting concept for for them that they're not sitting back and being conservative yeah. after making $22 billion in, in yeah. 12 years. Yeah. So let us know in the comments section below. Do you agree with us in saying, and I guess with most people who are saying that this is possibly the best show, not best show, best episode so far, because we still don't know what episode nine is going to bring. Um, but let us know in the comment section below and tell us what you think about this episode. Um, I want to talk about what I had mentioned before, the Eternals. And there was, you sent me this, I think you sent me an, a, a, an article or, 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 or some website where they're talking about, they, 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 they got some inside information, some source that's close to this project that has said that people who have seen the Eternals are high on it. The quality is fantastic, they're saying. Same the studio. The studio was blown away. The studio by what okay. turned in. That's the report. Hey, we've been saying that Eternals is gonna be something different and something amazing for quite some time. That first shot of the Eternals or that sneak, or that I guess it was concept art of this big humanoid figure showing a small planet in front of him. 
and then you see uh the shot of all the eternals of these big huge humanoids walking and the clouds are by their knees this is going to be cinematographer cinematography is going to be amazing yeah for this i am so hyped for this film and like i said before this will give us a little bit more insight into the mutant gene how much more are you looking forward to seeing eternals oh i can't wait i mean i think like i said i mean chloe Zhao made her name in indies it i think she's got a pretty good shot to be nominated for an oscar for i think it's nomadland which just yes. gets screaming um so yes. you know and she's in the running to win that award so you may be looking at a reigning best best director when that movie hits you know which is something I haven't necessarily seen but yeah look i mean this is for me i like i said i am a mythology sucker um you know growing up yeah. as a kid greek norse roman don't care so if you just want to make it an mcu version of that i'm here for it um yeah. and so if this is pulled off and well executed and I mean, in, yeah, this is one of the projects when I saw that they greenlit it and then who they got to be in it. Like, yeah. You know, the, it's just what an eclectic, diverse cast of talent. I was like, hey, you know, I just find it, yeah, I find it hard to believe they would all sign up if they didn't believe that they were part of something different. Uh, so, different, yeah, different, super duper excited. Yeah. yeah, different and special. I think the Eternals is going to be, hopefully it's not going to be just a one-off, uh, but we'll see. Because again, with Kevin, it all depends on the story and where they're going. This may just be a, an instance of we see, just to get a little bit of backstory on what's to come next with the X-Men, this may be just a one-off, but we'll see. We'll see. And Kevin hinting that maybe WandaVision just a one-off. He definitely was saying, you know, in his interview this week, like, it's WandaVision, Doc Strange 2. There's no plans right now to bring them back together for, he said he could, you know, they could do it down the road, obviously not closing the door, yeah, but it's yeah. not been planned as a multi-season show. Yeah. And so they're going out the, next week. They're going and, out as a bridge into the movie. That's. And as you said before, if you've been watching the show, we said this uh, in, in a previous conversation where, you know, some of these shows may not go on for more than a season or two depending on the story that's being told and it all makes sense because obviously yeah a, a season uh, uh uh like wandavision being fantastic as it is may not lend itself to a second season depending on what's going on in the overall marvel universe uh but you know like I said, we've been saying this for quite some time already. And, you know, uh, Kevin knows what he's doing. Kevin, he, man, I, if I could be him for, for a year <laughs> in those rooms, talking about the stories that they are planning out. Um, it's just, just imagine talking about this for hours and hours and really creating this, yeah. this world. But it's a, it's a gift to have as as good a hit rate as he does for what not to do versus what to do because you know the ideas are endless with a universe like this which means there's a lot of ideas that never made it to the screen and i you know there's a percentage of those that you probably would hear him and say man this would have been bad if they you know like if they'd yeah. gone done this they would have been a, we'd have been in some serious trouble so the ability to recognize and have a high hit rate out of the gate and the ability to course correct when you realize that the audience is not responding or that it's kind of been a mistake and it's not working, that's the gift of, yeah. you know, sort of a, he's, he's not a director, but he's kind of a maestro. Yes. Sort of what, yeah. He is exactly that. That is, he is the maestro. He is the one conducting <laughs> and doing all the things necessary. I want that to be this. We need to make it like that. Get me somebody that can give me that. I won't be able to do it. I probably don't command that 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 performance from someone but a director a person who knows who who knows what how to direct can bring that performance the of what my vision is and uh he's doing a fantastic job um kevin feige also talked about rated r mm -hmm. films they asked them a question about rated r films is deadpool the only one and he Listen, and he wasn't incorrect when he said, we've been doing just fine without doing rated R films. Deadpool for right now is the only rated R film, which, you know, that's what it was. And that's how, and 
and that's the the popularity it gained because it was and because of the, what they did it'll be a mistake to rain that down and give us a pg-13 level of, of deadpool um why take the chance right let's go with what's been working but with some some overseeing aspect uh, of kevin to make sure that we're not going too overboard right it'll be yeah difficult. look i mean yeah nothing in the core mcu that they've got on the schedule requires the r rating for it to be authentic or to be accepted by fans i think it links to another comment he or another question he was asked about which was the netflix shows and the netflix actors i think that's where down the road you'll face more questions because i don't think you could ever do a punisher that wasn't rated R, of course for so I don't even think you could really do a daredevil after the ones that have been done and say, hey, we're going to dial this back. I think that's a tough, that's a tough maneuver to pull off. So I think right now he's fine to punt. And I think it's also maybe a little bit of public, public negotiation because, you know, if Deadpool 3 raises the bar and crushes it at the box office, it's a lot easier to go to the mothership and say, look, <laughs> look what I can do with a rated R product, give me, give me a little leeway to do that with a few other characters with, with Disney. So, um, right now I think it's, you know, as we see in his interviews, he is very careful not to ruffle the feathers of the other divisions, right? He, the star Wars stuff, he swears off R rated stuff. When he works for a family friendly company, he's very cautious. Like, but I don't think for a second, he wouldn't push for it. If he thought he had the, a character and a vision and a story that would make a lot of money and be very popular, so. Do you think Blade gets a rated R? Yes. But I, I think we're just not far enough along for that question to be on. Entertained, the yeah, 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 yeah. Tell, let us know what you think about Eternals. Are you guys excited for Eternals? Because uh, um, there's a lot of excitement surrounding this. And I, and just recently there was uh, there was some sort of art revealed of them in their suits. I don't know if you got a chance to see that. Um, visually, I mean, this is going to be fantastic. Let us know in the comment section below uh, what you think about Eternals. And also let us know uh, about that rated R um, uh, for Deadpool. It's, grantingly, we, we, we're going to get that. But do you think it should be the only one? I'll ask you guys that question. Do you think? Where, where do you want it used? If yeah. you want it used again, where do you want it used? What characters, what stories? Yeah, yeah. and it'll be the obvious ones. Punisher, possibly Daredevil. Although Daredevil, I think you could probably get by a PG-13. Depends on the situation. Depends on who's in there. I love it, that series so much. It'd be tough after having yeah. a whole talk. That will come up in a later part of this show. But I yeah. just, the, 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 I don't know. I do yeah. think the, the intensity of the violence in that show was actually relevant to how good it was. And that's why I think it was a little, it'd be a little hard to imagine that as a PG-13. Yeah. Um, so we finally got the title for, uh, for Spider-Man. Hilarious reveal, by the way. Oh yeah. Yeah. They gave it <laughs> home wreck. <laughs> this is, there was a, there was a bunch of them <laughs> that were really funny. Um, but we finally got the title. Um, still no, People are dancing around the, the the topic of Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire showing up. Uh, and, and if you watch this show enough, um, you know where we stand with the direction of the upcoming Spider-Man and where we would like it to go. And what's interesting to me, and I wanted to ask you, Brian, Tom Holland said that this is the last movie uh, on his contract. Yeah. So the question is, or questions are, do you think he signs back up? And do you think this possible break that he may have will be used to build up to the multiverse? Well, he already indicated he wants to come back. So I think this is really a function of and he made a reference to Marvel and Sony with when they re-upped their partnership after it seemed like it was going to fall apart. 
Maybe I think just... made some phone calls, crying and stuff. Make trying to you know, come on, man, sign this. Come on, man. <laughs> you know, so maybe he's just paying public lip service and being a good soldier. But he made a comment to the effect of there were things in place in this partnership that maybe weren't in place in the original one that would help kind of ensure continuity going forward. And he hoped that he would be a part of that. Yeah, I think with the multiverse, it really just comes down to do the studios want to stick with sort of this iteration of Peter Parker at this age versus do they want to go different earth Peter Parker at a different age? Do they want to bring Miles Morales in? You know, there's this have both coexist in some way. I think that's very TBD. Um, yeah. I think obviously once we get to the end of this film, we will know kind of what the, there'll have to be some bridge, I think, to where we're headed. But I don't think it's a given. I probably, you know, if, again, I'm always doing odds. Like I would say probably 60 to 65% chance he comes back right now. But I think the the 35% is really, I don't know what Kevin's vision is for Spider-Man beyond this. Like, and that's the big question. And Tom Holland may just have aged out or just not be what they want to use for the next Spider-Man. And not to say he couldn't come back down the road as an older version of himself, but you know, they may switch it up. Yeah, I think we might get a run of Miles Morales. Um, Tom Holland is definitely gonna come back. I think they're gonna build towards, towards the multiverse and he'll sign up for that, that story. There's no way he's gonna turn that down because it's he owes something. his career to them. Oh yeah, he will oh, yeah. always come back. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, even though it's the last film on his contract, he's definitely going to come back for that uh, uh, part of uh, of the MCU if they ever tell that story, which they most likely will, because they know how you know people want this. It's not like you know this is something in being introduced new. Uh, look at Into the Spider Verse and how. Um, phenomenal that film was and how people want this live action version to be on screen. So there's no way they're not going to do it. And there's no way that Tom Holland is not going to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. So let us know in the comment section below, what do you think about uh, Tom Holland being, this being his last movie in the MCU and whether or not he comes back, what do you think he's going to do? And, and how long do you think till we get a multi-verse film with all the Spider-Man, Tony McGuire, Andrew Garfield, because it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. But how long do you think um, they they will tell that story is gonna be in two, three, four films? Let us know in the comment section below. And also we have a, a segment where we're gonna give uh, you guys a top five of superhero fight scenes. And the reason why we're doing this is because Tom Holland has spoken again, saying, yes, stop, saying that he saw an edit, that they've been shooting a fight scene for a few months and he saw an edit and this to him is the most impressive fight scene that, he, that has ever been on film, ever. In a superhero movie in a superhero movie. So we wanted to go back to the archives and say, what is, what is he up against? Yeah, exactly. He's going to go for, if he's going for the trophy. What is he <laughs> up against? Yeah. Cause to say this will be the most impressive is putting a lot of pressure on him and Kevin, Kevin must be like, come on, what are you saying? Chill. We've already we got, got most ambitious superhero <laughs> film, ever, and now we have best fight in a superhero film ever already from this guy. Listen, when Infinity Gauntlet storyline, when Thanos first showed up on screen and I saw that, I said, oh my God, are they doing this? Are they really doing this? Although, they didn't give us the exact story of the Infinity Gauntlet. Gauntlet. They totally did a fantastic job in just a retelling of this story. And so that was super ambitious because I didn't know how they were going to pull it off. But 10 years later, 
we got a fantastic story and ending to yep. this. So for him to say, just speak, just to speak those words, this is the most ambitious or this is the most impressive. It's like, come on, just just say this is gonna be dope and that's it, move on. But I'm gonna give, give you the you... flip side to this. Yes. It's seared into my brain. Okay. In 2003, when The Matrix Reloaded and Revolutions were coming out six months apart, HBO did their first look, which they always do for a lot of these films. And I think it was Joel Silver, who was the producer on that movie, was talking about Revolutions. And he go, gives this huge speech about, we have taken visual effects and storytelling and science fiction as far as they can possibly go. I don't need to tell you guys what happened six months after he said that. <laughs> so every time I hear stuff like this, it gets I you think of that and yeah. say, you better not be, you yeah. better not be building me up to give me something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is going to be interesting. But So we're going to give you our top five superhero fight scenes in film that we think are not necessarily that they're difficult to beat, but they set a high bar. Yeah. And uh, uh, let's it puts a lot of pressure on, on Mr. Holland um, for saying that. But let's get into some other news. Big news, yeah. I don't know. This is not Superman reboot just yet. Well, I would say both of these are big news, though, and they're connected. Yes, yes. Yeah. Brian, you sent me an article. First of all, it was a long ass article, and I was like, "Damn, I gotta read this." But you I said, it, "Oh yeah, it was definitely worth it." I said, "I deserve to read this because you know this man has been through a lot." And when I say this man, I'm saying Zack Snyder has been through a lot. After reading this, and I'll put this in the description below so that you guys can check it out. I suggest you guys read it. It is a, a very, very telling, uh, thoughtful, thoughtful article, um, and it tell talks about a lot of the things that Zach went through in doing this movie, and finally uh, sh being able to share his vision with us. And I read this article and it is not like it changed my mind regarding the films that he previous done regarding Man of Steel and Bat Batman versus Superman. I still might had my issues with them, but with Justice League in particular, you know, he had the tragedy in his family that, you know, you felt for him. He was very open about it in this. Oh, yeah. This yeah, project. yeah. He sort of made some sort of peace with it, but he yeah. really shared a lot of details about it. Yes. And 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 that was and when I read that, I was like, man, I can't wait to see this movie because even though if, if you've seen our show, um, we have our thoughts on it. I still want to see it for him because he wants to show us this, whether we like it or not, he, it doesn't matter to him. And I've, and I've made this comment before where, where, you know, a lot of us have read comics and they're not written by the same person every single time. There's always someone new that comes in and gives them, gives you guys their vision of what this character is. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. These are one of those times that for, for many, um, it just didn't work for me anyway. Um, the characters of Superman and Batman and, and, and things of that nature. Um, but he went through a lot in in doing this film. There was there's a there's a there's a part in this article where he had this movie sitting on his laptop, you know, undone. Go ahead. That's an incredible piece of this article. Yeah. Because like you know, you and I work in professional work environments and workplaces we could never walk out of our workplaces with anything close to what that like because sheer luck yeah. that he was able to take that unfinished print with him almost as like a souvenir like he yeah. describes it as like well i was just taking it for posterity like i wasn't taking it because i thought of it in any way yeah, 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 and yeah. To, for that to then be there 
when this would come back around. And I will give him credit, and I agree with him 100%, which was there's that sequence where they talk about releasing it in its unedited form. Yes, I was just thinking about and that. I was like, that would have been wrong. To oh, him. hells yeah. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. I was like, if you're going to do this, you need to let me finish it. Ex exactly. Warner Brothers did him dirty and tried to do him dirty so many times. Warner Brothers, I get the release, the release of the Snyder Cut movement. I get it. I understand that. Um, Warner Brothers, to to ask him to release it as is, is a is 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 a it's a is sort of disrespectful and offensive. And to to show something that's undone is like me giving you. Oh, I'm cooking up this steak and stuff like that. I, it's not done. You should serve it like that. What? Come on. So the fact that they get, they, they let him do that is, you know, they're not doing it because they feel bad. They're doing it because they, they want subscribers on HBO Max. They just get that out the way. That's why they're doing this. Because they, they see the numbers. After what three years of release of Snyder Cut? Okay, there's an audience out there. Let's do it, and they put the money up. There were a couple of things in this article that I also thought were confirmed things that I suspected about him, or at least the way this article is written. So number one is that he's a nice guy. Yeah, I think yeah. that comes across with his interactions with fans, critics, actors. Act. I always have the impression that he is genuinely a nice guy, and you see that. In Hollywood, there often seems to be, there's directors that people work with because they're so talented and so great that everyone lines up to do it, regardless of how they're treated. Yeah. And then I think there's a camp of directors who everyone lines up to work with over and over again because they genuinely enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. And so I I don't think it's a coincidence that Zach has you know, a number of people who have collaborated with him multiple times. I think it speaks well probably for his style of direction and the way he treats people on set. So I, I, reading that, made a lot of sense to me. I think the other thing that came through in this article and really got me kind of thinking about from the standpoint of um, Zach's talent is he almost has too many ideas. Like that yeah. I felt came through in this article yes. where it's like, yes. he, like he yes. pushes it, then he pushes it another 10%, yes. another yes. 10%. Yes, yes, yes. And it, it made me think about like, because he clearly has ability, like what would I give him? What would I want to give him to like harness the ability in a way that, we get the best pot. I think I would want to pair him with a writer. That would be my, I think about it in the history, like Steven Spielberg had David Kep, um, Martin Scorsese had Paul Schrader. There are a lot of these tandems where it's like, you write, I'll direct. I shoot, but yeah. it's not totally separate. Or even if I think about music, Bernie Taupin and Elton John, right? Like mm -hmm. you create the, the, the sounds, I'll create the words. Like, we talk about Zach so much. The visual talent is on question. It's the editing a lot of times. It's some of the storytelling that sometimes is uneven. And I think some of it's because he almost has too many ideas yeah, percolating yeah, in his head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think it that definitely came from comes this out article like where it's like yeah. you could see the hit rates. Like yeah. here he was, you know, with Gal Gadot, home run. Like yeah. with some of the other choice, like may, you know, maybe there, there, if there was a second voice in the room. <clears throat> who was not a studio exec just trying to police him, but someone who was genuinely aligned with him, but could push back at the right moment to say like, hey, you know, maybe not that, maybe yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that mu that must have sucked for him to have people policing. Oh, brutal. You know, having, uh, what's it, Jeff Johns and, and, and another guy, I forget the other guy's name, but just there Berg, to- John Berg. Yes, to, to make sure that, he doesn't go overboard because like you, as you said, he has so many ideas. You have to have somebody there, I guess, in a situation like this to bring it back because when you're doing, and I get where Warner Brothers is coming from. When you're doing Justice League, you're expecting a billion dollars off the rip. Sure. You know, and they wanted to make sure that it doesn't go, it, that it, it doesn't make that. Or that the movie is is bad, or that that you know that you risk l losing out on that billion dollars because Justice League should have been a billion dollars and more. Yeah, but unfortunately, and there was another thing. Uh, 
with regard to the ideas. There was an idea that I sort of would have liked to seen on screen. And I'm, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about of him, of Batman and Lois Lane hooking up. Well, that was straight out of world's finest. Yeah. That's why I was like, was okay. The first time we got into that, I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, that was a big part of that was her, yeah. him flirting with her and her kind of going along with it. Yeah. But Superman was alive in the world's finest, <laughs> but this one, you, you know. The article did not answer one question I've always had, which is, was the decision to introduce Batman his decision or the studios? And I don't think he'd ever say it if it wasn't, mm -hmm. but this article mentions that the 668 million global box of Man of Steel was deemed a disappointing result. And anytime I hear that, that points me toward the studio- Wanting more and making him put Batman in before he was ready. And I, I just wonder in the back of my head whether his original vision was a longer arc that might have had more of like a Man of Steel sequel versus we're, we're going full on, full tilt toward the Justice League with Batman and Wonder Woman coming in right away. I just, I don't know. And the article didn't touch on it at all. Yeah. I think if, if, if that was the case, let's say Zack Snyder had other plans, but obviously the, the, the Warner Brothers forced his hand into going this direction. But I think a sequel to a man of steel would have probably lent itself to a little bit of more course correction mm -hmm. and, uh, and, a, and a better product towards the end of his run on on the, on these dc films but you know you you already we already see how warner brothers work it's all about the money in my opinion it's all about the money and they will do whatever they think is correct and there's some others that they'll step back and let it be because these directors aren't going to take that as you can see with the joker i'm pretty sure there was no not too much i'd say involvement on their end um but with these other projects they've meddled and meddled and 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 they haven't been that successful it made me think back to a discussion we had which was when everyone zach snyder was talking about the mcu the marvel property he would want to do and we kind of laughed at it and said, no, this mm -hmm. article made me reconsider that a little bit. It made me at least say, look, if he was open to what I just suggested, if he was open to Kevin Feige being that second voice in the room, it made me more open to the idea of like, maybe there is a property in, maybe not the one he was talking about, but maybe there's a property, maybe it's an R-rated property down the road. Or if Zach is willing to be edited by Kevin, but not by the rest of the studio, maybe there's something there that visually would be very cool to see. Zach Snyder, his ability visually to show something on screen is fantastic. I was watching Man of Steel today and I'm like, man, the potential was so much there. It was just story that was kind of off for me. And obviously the character and who he was that was off for me. But visually, he can pull a lot of things off. Like that new trailer for um, the movie that he's doing on Netflix looks Army dope. Yeah. Looks dope. Yeah. Um, but listen, if if those parameters are set where he comes into Marvel and there's some parameters that he can't... Not parameters. I don't want to put like a, a, a leash on him, but let's agree to do this. Let's go this route. Let's tighten up this. Let's do this this way. Obviously with Zach's input and whoever else is in there so that to, to deliver a cohesive story um, and do a great film, I think he will have success because he's had success in the past. There's no question about it. 300, Watchmen, I loved. Um, it's just when he's left to his own devices is where we, we, we get not so great films. So, um, but again, for those of you who don't know the full story behind the scenes of what went on with the Justice League, 
please read that read that article i i, I recommend it if, if even if, listen you don't even have to hit that like button but read that article yeah it's in variety yeah it's yeah. worth it yeah it's definitely worth it um this leads us to an announcement that um we got yesterday <clears throat> regarding superman um and a possible reboot reboot and um ta tani tani what was it tani tanahasi coats tanahasi coats is writing jj abrams is producing and uh uh hannah mingela will serve as producer as well on this film um there some rumors about this not being uh, a Superman that will involve Henry Cavill. There's some rumors that this Superman will be a uh, person of color. And before we get into the Henry Cavill situation, the person of color thing concerns me only in this way this if is it's, where we're probably going to disagree so go yeah for it. yeah yeah i mean we, and we've disagreed on this in the past um if it's clark kent superman and he's a person of color i have an issue with i because we have some people are saying that this might be um um what's the what's the other super, yeah that one and there's another one Zod. Oh yeah, They're connected to Zod, right? It's yes, like, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. So those two are, are, are Superman uh, from different Earths or whatever. So they may play around with that. Listen, I'm cool with that. <clears throat> but if it's Clark Kent, I have a problem with. It. Now, I just want to say this. Even though I'm cool with it, I still have an issue somewhat because listen. This Henry Cavill Superman or Clark Kent, they haven't just found the right person to tell this story, to give us a great... They, they, to me, it's sort of like they're giving up on this character and want to go a different route. They want to change it up because for some reason, they're unable to give us a, 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 a great Superman film. And they and they and by doing this, they want to change it up for the purposes of, uh, for whatever reason they want to do it. Uh, uh, they just want to change it up and give us a new Superman. If it's Clark Kent, I have a problem with it. If he's black, if he's if he's, they just need to recast, which I always said that they would, give us a new Superman. Cool. Most people, I think, will be upset because it isn't Henry Cavill. Uh, people think that he as Superman is fantastic. And I think there'll probably be some backlash if they recast him um, with a different Superman. Um, that's, you know, so what are your thoughts on, on this whole Superman reboot person of color? Uh, listen, if it's Clark Kent and he's black, I have a problem. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm telling you, you yeah, I, I completely disagree with you. Okay. Um, and I'll make, let me make the case for, for this and what I, reading the tea leaves, I think might be underneath a little bit here. So number one is, I would, so ta Coates has written for, so he's a, he's, he's a famous writer. Yes, yes, yes. Not yes, of yes. the genre. Period. Yeah, 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 he yeah. has written in the genre. He's had a run <clears> on Black Panther where he's actually written some of the comics. Yes. This is yes. not, you know, somebody who's super smart and accomplished just saying, hey, I can drop in and do Superman. Like yeah. this guy has been in the world. Mm -hmm. I would suspect he has a very specific idea and he already knows what it is and he pitched it to JJ. And the reason I say that is because that's how Man of Steel was born originally, mm -hmm. was David Goyer and Christopher Nolan had a very general idea. They called up Warner Brothers following Dark, because they worked together on Batman Dark Knight. They called up Warner Brothers and said, hey, what about this for Superman? And that's how Man of Steel was created. 
I suspect something similar here. I think either JJ Tanahasi, some combination, already had this idea in the hopper and basically went to the studio and said, why don't we try this? Because the character's just not quite resonating right now. And that's my second argument for why you try this now. It's because, you know, whether we agree, Henry Cavill, underrated, underutilized, his run may end as one of the great what ifs in comic book movie making. Yeah. But the reality is the box office attached to his name wearing the S is not where it should be. Mm -hmm. So I understand the viewpoint of let's try something else. And if we're going to try something else, why don't we really try something else? <laughs> and to okay. me, and this is where I make the case, I do not think there is anything about Clark Kent that you can't <clears throat> adapt successfully into a different ethnicity. I just don't see it. Mm -hmm. I, I, he can be a journalist. He can, he can come from a farm if that's what you want. I, there's mm -hmm. nothing about that to me that says being Caucasian informs what he becomes later in life as a superhero. And if anything, I think given the times we live in, and we've talked about some of the storylines you could adapt, I think there are some interesting directions that maybe having a person of color in the suit would open up for you that I would be interested to see. Because it, it was interesting, the, the I was on a whole random podcast the other day, they played the clip from 1978 Superman of Christopher Reeve being interviewed by Lois Lane, where she asks him, why are you here? And he says in just very classic patriotic tone, I'm here to fight for truth, justice, and the American, American way. way. And you can't really do that right now in the same way. So okay. I think there's, I'm at least curious. And like I said, to me, Clark Kent as an individual or comic character is not sacred just because he's always been depicted a certain way um, through the years. So I'm okay. If now, if they want to do Calvin Ellis, I'm not saying I'm opposed to that either, but mm -hmm. I'm saying if they want to go for it and they want to just, and they want to change Clark Kent, I'm, I'm not opposed to it in a way that like, I was thinking the other day, I was like, okay, what if this was 1991 Denzel? So this is, he's won the Academy Award for glory. He's coming off of Malcolm X, but he's young. He's not yet on the road. And they said, we have this brilliant idea for Clark Kent, Superman, but it only works if Denzel plays Clark Kent. I'm dying to see that movie. I, I just, I don't care that it's, that it's a person of color. So yeah, I mean, my, I rather, that's my stance on it. Yeah. I, I, and you know, I mean, you know, Hey, we can agree to disagree and that's just fine. I just think that there are other characters that could better suit um, that type of role. I mean, you can do icon. I'm dying to see an icon film. You can do uh, uh, a Blue Marvel in, in the MCU. Um, those characters are yet to be done. And I think if you do it with Superman, it loses, I guess, possibly that effect, I think, for me uh, of seeing that uh, for the first time. Um, I don't know. We'll see, man. Because I've seen there's people going a little bit overboard with, you know, the the outrage. If that were to be the case, that Clark Kent is 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 a uh, is is a person of color. But if they do it, you know, if it's Calvin Ellis or or, or the other uh, Superman character that's also a person of color, then I'm cool with it. You know, I, I'd see it. Yeah. But yeah, people need to relax. Um, we just want a great Superman. Film. Yeah. Let's get that on the board. Yeah. I don't care yeah. who's playing him. Let's get that on the board. Yeah. So let us know in the comment section and take it easy. Okay. Don't go crazy. <laughs> in the let us know in the comment section below what, what do you think about this possibility? But I think you raised the issue, which is there's two questions within here. There's mm -hmm. the there's the overarching person of color question for this part, which we've talked about on prior pods but your part your point which i acknowledge is the same character you know they've done this with incredible hulk right like amadeus Ch like they they've 
they've given different iterations of the same character with different ethnicities. So the second question is, you know, are you, you know, as, as fans, like, are you okay with the original iterations? Like if they're changing Clark Kent, Bruce Wayne, Peter Parker, if those names and identities are becoming people of color, how do you feel about that versus Miles Morales, Calvin Ellis, or established comic characters who were already introduced as people of color, but as different runs in the same alter ego. Like those mm. are two different, maybe two different questions for people. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. They're yeah. worth they're, you know, they're they're both worth debate. So yeah, yeah. But I think like I said, our unifying theme is we want to see great Superman. Period. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. That that's at the end of the day, that's what we want to see. Um I just don't think they should throw that in there just to make it different. I, I, you know, it, it's just, should it, I, I, I don't want to feel like it's, I don't want to feel like I'm being, you know, I don't, I don't want to use the P word pandering. You know, I don't want to feel like it is um, by doing so if they use that with Clark Kent. So let's see what they do. Um, let us know in the comments section what you guys think about this, uh, this topic. Now, top five. This was a hard mm. top five. And we got to lay out our rules too, because there were yes. some rules to this. Yes. So a lot of people will get confused. So. Yeah. So the rules is that it has to be a film, right? Uh, of of fight scenes that were impressive. It doesn't necessarily have to be one on one, um, but one on one and one against many, and not a scene that poses no threat to. The superheroes like for example right. we we spoke about it um when we were setting up the the rules it can't be although it was a fantastic scene nightcrawler um in x-men 2 that doesn't really count although it was fantastic it was fantastic but it really posed no threat to nightcrawler it was just you know he went and did his thing um but likewise, this has to likewise like the the, the truck flipping in the dark night epic yeah. chase scene yeah where he's not really fighting hand to hand at any yeah. point in that scene so exactly something like that would not count either so you want to do from five to number one to your number one or well just... i have a question for you first before oh, okay. we start because we said no tv i think i think no tv you did all live action too right Yes, yes, yes. No, all, no yeah. animation. We said no, yeah, no animation. Tom Holland is in a live action movie. So we ruled yeah. out animation, even though they're animated films. If the Daredevil series had been eligible, oh, would yeah. it have been number one? It would have probably taken at least two, two, two spots. I agree with you. Yeah. And I think anyone who hasn't seen it, <laughs> just go on YouTube and watch the clips. Yeah. of the single shot hallway fight, the stairwell fight, the prison riot fight, that even the Nobu fight. There's like four or five fight scenes in that show that that show alone that yeah. would make a top 10 or top 15. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, exactly. So I, in some ways I think we I rule I wanted to rule out TV because it almost felt like a cheat code to like including that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So um, and yeah, so we we had so those were kind of our main our main rules. I did have some honorable mentions. Did you have any ones that like were? No, last, I had your, like like I again I had trouble coming up with five. Um, my five may not be as extensive as yours, uh, but uh, I had to really think. There was like three obvious to me, and then the other two were just me thinking, and I like there's nothing that really. Uh, competes with these other two, even though most people will say that it may or may not count, but this is all I had. Um, but no, I didn't have any honorable mentions. What were all yours? Right. So I'll give you an honorable mention. So I came up with 10 total, so five honorable mentions <laughs> that were very hard to cut. So, and it came from different places. So one is the rave intro of Wesley Snipes' Blade. Okay. Did not make my list, but I counted as a fight scene and I think people forget this movie because it was 1998. We had not seen a comic book movie like this. It is the opening scene of the movie. And you get to see, you know, a guy with charisma, martial arts talent, wielding his weapons against vampires. And it's just like a, and the, and the effects look hokey. They yeah. age kind of poorly now, but 
it was people forget that was a new era for comic book filmmaking and i just think if you haven't seen that movie in a while with everything that's out there now do yourself a favor and like just flip it on because yeah, that's yeah. fight scene and his fight with deacon frost at the end there's some yeah. good action in that yeah. movie yeah that is like where we're headed over the next 20 years so yes. that was one honorable mention second honorable mention uh, we mentioned Zack Snyder's visual, visual, visual talent, Watchmen, um, the prison fight. Yes. Night Owl and Silk Spectre. This is when yes. Zack to me is still, is more edited. Yeah. It is, there's some awesome stylization in this, but it's not so chaotic that you can't figure out what's going on. They're incredibly badass. Mm -hmm. um, love this scene and where they yeah. go into rescue Rorschach. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's not long, but I think it's incredibly well done. Um, I, if I had an audible best it would probably be um, when the, the comedian fights, uh, 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 what's his dude, in his apartment. Oh, Ozeman like, Yes, yes, also, yes. Also yes. a great fight. Yeah. yeah. That movie has real great fight choreography. Yes, like, yes. Yeah. Again, another movie if you haven't seen recently, pick it up. It's better than you probably remember. Um, number three is more sentimental because it's not really like super quality of good effects, but the Battle of Metropolis and Superman 2. That was the first for me as a kid, the first time I saw a superhero fight on screen where I thought it was oh super cool. Oh my god, yes. Damn. You know, but like, I couldn't put it in the top five because like the effects are hokey. You know, yeah. you could tell like it, it's, you know, it's a little bit cheap, but it was such a payoff. Yeah, it's like man, I can see Superman like punching and throwing and doing stuff that like I never thought was possible on screen. Yeah. I had to put it out as an honorable mention of these, so that was mm -hmm. three. Number four, um, Hulk versus Abomination, an Incredible Hulk. I think that's an <laughs> underrated fight. I think it's I think it's the best fight. I, so a lot of people would have said like Hulkbuster fight. I, I like this one. I actually yeah. like them running down the streets of Harlem. Oh yeah, and then the way it, I, I think this movie is underrated um and, and and i think it ages well i watched yeah. it actually the other it was rambling on tv the other day i watched it and i was like oh yeah this is pretty good i like yeah, the yeah. intensity of this the last one my hardest cut and it probably could have made the top five was the battle on titan and infinity war i really wanted to put this in the top five but i kind of felt like i couldn't put so many like i but i love this fight because in infinity war it was the first time where our, you saw Thanos really wield the gauntlet against the heroes. Yes. And it was just him and the heroes were teaming up powers against him and he was still beating them all around. Yeah. The like he killed yeah. Tony Stark. And it, 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 yeah, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't believe I didn't, I didn't even think about a, that. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of ends with like a, hey, we got to give him what he wants. So that maybe <laughs> knocks out of the top five. But I tell you, man, when he grabs the moon and kind of throws it with the cut, it's, like, it, it's off the hook. So oh, that no, was no, my no, hardest no. cut. But those my, are my, my favorite. My, my favorite scene in that fight sequence was, was when um, Doctor Strange splits himself into so many different uh, <laughs> Doctor Strange, and, and oh man, that was that was that was dope. Doctor Strange was one of the MVPs of that that franchise. So those are my five that didn't make the list, but if you know you want to spend some time on YouTube having fun, they're all worth a watch, a rewatch. Yeah. All right, you want so, to start with your number five? Okay. <laughs> so, damn, I feel bad, like, because my number five, and it's, and it's weak, and I know it's weak, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I really tried to put thought into it, and I, and I, don't, know, I, don't, I don't know why I didn't choose some of the ones that you mentioned. Uh, there was one that you did mention that I have it in my top five, but my number mm -hmm. five is uh, uh, Marvel's Avengers in that the last sequence uh, in New York. Yeah, okay. That was what, like 20, 30, 20 minutes, 30 minutes of, 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 of action and, and figuring out to, how to do this and doing that. And, and it's just one of those uh, scenes that you just watch over and over again because it was just done so so amazingly well and that's my number five what's your favorite sub like what's your favorite element of the battle of new york what's your what's your like the favorite shot or like iconic moment within that sequence i think it has to when each of them have their moment um when the hulk smash and hulk goes boom and, and does what he's thinking and hulk and thor um, when they have that small scene together, um, when Captain America is doing his thing and he's telling the cop, you know, do this, do this, what makes you think you can do it? And then he does his thing and then like, yo, do this. You know, they had so many, there's just so many little scenes like that that put everything together 
that um, yeah, every body was important in that sequence and and that whole shot when they're all together and they do that it was just it was just Josh Whedon you know you got to give it up to him for that for that for that movie yeah no I, I didn't make my list because like I said I st but the two favorite moments I have in there are one I'm always angry like that to yeah. me is that was a that was when Mark Ruffalo Hulk peaked yeah, 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 yeah. I'm yeah, always yeah. angry. And yeah. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, I think I think the, the sort of the panoramic shot of the six of the, of, of the six of them before they kind of go off and and do their thing. So I think that yeah, no, that's that's not an, that's a highly defensible choice. So yeah. like I said, not did not make my list, but no, I don't think anyone would be like weird eye that you put <laughs> that in the top five. All right, so my 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 number five um, is Bane breaks Batman in Dark Knight Rises. I okay. Think for, so the the reason why the two reasons why i think it made the list for me were one the choice not to use music it's just him beating on him so you hear every crack and mm -hmm. piece of it and him taunting him it, i mean it's where nolan does things i think that other directors can't like you yeah. feel like that fear yeah like you yeah, feel like yeah, that, oh yeah. man he's gonna oh, yeah. take it Oh, and, yeah. and at the same time, you're like, is he really going to have the iconic moment? And then he delivers that moment. I was waiting and for I that. I just felt like it was like, the, it was the, that movie is a tough watch because it's yeah. so dark. Yeah. But to me, that is the highlight of that movie and that they gave you that moment and, it, and it's done well and Tom Hardy's great in it. I, to me, that is a real comic true tale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought about that, but the reason why I didn't added to my top five is because to me none of the batman films has really given us that batman fighting prowess that he has in the animated films and the comics it hasn't really given us that oh my god moment um which there's a lot of people that would probably argue for a warehouse scene in BBS. Oh, yeah, bro, it's, bro, 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 bro. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of my it's one of my oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so except for that, um but I agree with you. Yeah, I had the yeah. same issue. Batman yeah. films, Batman fights have not been probably what they should have been. Now that may be yeah. about to change yeah. in the Batman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. Um, my number four. Uh, oh, and another thing. He did fight like young man. <laughs> you know, when he was fighting, it was just, for me, it was like, there wasn't anything that he was doing to Bane that was so like, oh, snap. It was just Bane. Just, and I agree with you in the sense that it was a really intense moment. But I've seen better um, fight sequences than that. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's why it wasn't on my top five. But my number four is the Batman Warehouse. Yeah, okay. That scene, I got to give it up for Zach for that, for that scene. That is perhaps, for me, in the Batman films, in film in, gen in general, when it comes to Batman, that is the best Batman fight sequence I've seen on film for Batman. It was just, uh, it, it reminded you of the scenes where he takes on five or six different people in the animated series and in the comics. And, and it just showed his, his, his ability to fight. And to me, that was my number four. I think it's a, it's definitely a valid choice. I have another, I have a different Zach scene actually in my, in my top five, but one of the things I do like about that scene is there's a realism to look, this is just a dude with tools. If he was in these situations, there's no way that he'd be like going easy or, you know, like I get it. He doesn't kill when he doesn't have to, but mm -hmm. like, you know, if you were actually that guy as well-trained as you are, you'd have to do what you need to do yeah. to get through these thugs. Yeah, and you kind of yeah. see that in the warehouse scene. Like he takes damage, right? He yeah. takes damage in that scene. Yeah. And and he's kind of like desperate at times to get, get through them. So yeah, I, yeah, I do like that the approach he took, um, that urgency that he had. So yeah, no, I think that's a good choice. So my number four is actually a, a Zach scene as well, but it's, uh, it's from Man of Steel. I like the Battle of Smallville. 
and I'll, I'll make I'll ride for this one and I'll, I'll tell you why so there's two things there's two issues with this why it's not higher so one is the obvious which is the, him being willing to do it in the middle of the street with all the people around and the government coming in and opening fire on all these people with like innocent like tough like that's a little tough but mm -hmm. I will say this it's that moment until that moment, we had never, I don't think, we had never seen Superman on screen with like full force modern visual effects in a super power fight. Because Superman Returns didn't give us that. He didn't yeah. do that at all. No. So there was something to them walking down the street and that anticipation of what is this going to look like? when they start doing this. And then I think he made some really inspired choices, which was one, yeah, he would not be that experienced at this. And I love that about this fight, that he's kind of not that good. Like yeah. he's <laughs> able to do a lot, but he gets his ass kicked because he's not a really a soldier. Yeah, exactly. And I love the choice of that, where like, especially, I'm I'm a big fan of Feora. I think that's one of the most underrated parts of Man of Steel. She should have had a bigger role. She beats the crap out of him in this scene. And I love the way they shoot it. It's also, I like that Zach doesn't do slow-mo in this. He actually yeah. does it as our perspective of super mm. speed. Yeah. Which I think is a great choice. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> I, I I like those little, and we have Superman, unlike at the end of the movie, saving the soldier, like doing some classic Superman sort of protectionist stuff yeah. that I think gets lost later in the film. Compared so to the I thousands that died movie. at his hand. <laughs> No, I just, but I remember watching in the theater being like, I've never seen, it, yeah. it felt very rewarding. It was like, I finally got to see Superman full out, modern effects, unleashing his powers against an evenly matched, you know, foe. And that felt very satisfying to me. Yeah, so. th this was like Superman 2 fights scene in Metropolis. Yeah. In 2.0. Yeah. what it would have looked like that they were actually doing having those superpowers what it would look like that's what it was like to me but yeah that, that that's a that's a good choice um <clears throat> my number three is uh superman versus superman spider uh, superman three <laughs> yeah you i love, love that scene, scene. <laughs> come on I like it too. Come <laughs> love this scene. <laughs> it, was just, it was just a dope scene man even though this not like nothing super impressive about it. it's just two dudes there's no like crazy superpower being used of this oh he doesn't even look like it even though they're grabbing stuff that things we probably wouldn't be able to grab and hit each other with but it's just christopher reeve just sh the emotion aspect of it Mr. and 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 him putting him through that that the conveyor belt and crushing him and you think he's being crushed it's like yo this dude is destroying him and Clark Kent with his glasses coming up clumsy climbing out of stuff <laughs> and, and 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 him you know it was just done really well and it was uh um, um I I love that scene that is the most memorable scene to me uh with Superman fighting that's, that's my number awesome. three I love yeah. how much you ride for this scene <laughs> it is the best part of Superman three by yeah, far yeah, yeah. That's, that's the only, much, I don't remember like, anything else yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, I feel, like, I feel like if you had put the, if you had mentioned the final fight scene with the video game, I don't think we could talk for a while. <laughs> it's so bad. Oh my God. I was, yo, that is just, yeah, it was really hor horrendous. <laughs> um, so my number three is from Captain America Winter Soldier. It is the running highway fight that they have, um, starting from the point where Winter Soldier jumps on the car, rips the steering wheel out, destroys the vehicle. But it leads to what I think is my favorite hand-to-hand -hand of the entire MCU. Like, not with superpowers. It's them on top of the kind of the bus. And, yeah. you know, you have the iconic shot of Winter Soldier punching the shield, ultimately taking the shield, which I think is not an accident. And then the reveal of his yeah. actual yeah. face. Yeah. And so, yeah. but then around that, you have his, his kind of running fight with Black Widow, which is a great part of this. Um, you have Cap kind of being, you know, detonated and like, it, it, but the way it's shot, it's like super, again, no slow-mo, it's super it's, paced. It, yeah, He's fighting cool. with the knife. Like it's incredible hand-to-hand -hand work. It's my, yeah. my favorite sequence in, in that. And you really have a sense of like, okay, I know Cap's getting through this, 
but like he does wound and he shoots natasha during this oh, scene yeah. like there's a sense of like there's some real danger to at least one of the heroes in this and i i love it that's that's my black so a lot of people would pick the elevator fight i like this one better. yeah yeah me too um that black widow always seems to do something dope in, in a lot of the action sequences that's that she's in um in that scene or that sequence this actually is my my, my number one the captain america winter soldier of uh, fight scene um when it starts from that point on to the end it's like i can watch that you know all day long but that scene that part where she um i think she throws herself off and then she hicks herself to the to the to the bridge yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. she comes and, under the bridge and, and then she's running that that's just, yeah. that's done so so flawlessly and it's just so dope and how she gets away and it's and then the hand to hand um fight sequence between uh, him and the winter soldier and there was no stunt doubles for that they were doing that you know and he was practicing that during takes cuz he wanted to make sure that this was going to look dope that to me that's my number one that's my number one. Um, my number two is actually the Hulk versus the Abomination, man. Well, Hulk oh, was gonna you, have it, you do have it in your top five. Yeah, I thought yeah. you were ready, like, you didn't have it. And I was like, oh. Nah, nah. Yo, he was going to kill Abomination, yo. The fact that he took a piece of his bone and stuck it in the bomb, because he was losing, right, yeah. that fight. And then that the, the 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 hand clap the the, the, the mm -hmm. what's it called the thunder clap hulk there was just so many things that he does in the in the comics and animation that he did in this film against a foe that usually gives him a run for his money and they actually pulled it off and to me that's just so it's just one of the most underrated uh fight sequences you know, uh, in, 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 in superhero films to me, that was one of the best. That's oh, my I'm number. We both number had two. that one on our list somewhere, yeah. at least some, cause yeah, yeah. I, I just think it is, it is criminally underrated now because yeah. of, people treat that film as if it never happened, except for Marvel, which brings back William, William Hurt. But, but, uh, I totally agree with you on that, on the quality of that and how hard it is to do. Cause that's a CGI fight, you know, that's yeah. hard to make look believable. So, yeah. um, so my number two is a, a little bit of an older one, but I think relevant to um, this is my this is my sort of challenge to Tom Holland. It's Spider Man Two. It's his fight with Doc Ock on the train. I think I, it's. I knew you were probably thinking of that one. <laughs> yeah, I knew you thinking of that one. But to me, the the thing I love about this is the the film does a great job of making it seem like he is genuinely struggling to balance fighting Doc Ock with stopping the train and saving the people. And I love the way that the, the scene constantly goes between those two things because yeah. Doc Ock is doing all sorts of things, messing with the people, messing with the train. And you're like, I don't know if he's gonna be able to get, yeah, get it yeah. all under control. And he obviously barely does with yeah. the web. I don't know what you call it at the end where he puts it between the buildings and stops yeah, the train. Yeah. But it, it's everything I wanted from a Spider-Man fight um, in sort of, you know, five minutes or whatever it is against one of his his arch nemeses. So, if Tom Holland can beat that in a Spider Man movie in terms of the intensity and, and the way it flowed, like, you know, more power to him. I can't wait to see it. But that was my number two. So, yeah, that that scene. I mean, you got to give it up to Alfred Molina for portraying. Uh, it's like it's hard to see anyone else playing that that character, Doc Ock. He made that. Uh, he lived up to. Um, one of the most iconic, iconic villains for Spider-Man. Uh, he lived up to that and made it even better. And to see it come to life, and uh, it was just uh, incredible to watch. And that fight sequence was was dope. You know, is you watching like, wow, that's Doc Ock, you know, on live action. You know, it, it was done so well. And yeah, that that's a that's a good that's a good pick. I, I was thinking about that one too, but for some reason, it just didn't make it. It's hard, you know, I thought about like older films are tough. Like it was interesting. Like I, I reviewed every fight in X-Men thinking there would probably be some Wolverine sequence that would make it. And none of them did. You know, I got to be honest, like even the one like in Logan, some people will point to, I just don't well, know for every great thing, great thing that Hugh Jackman did. I don't know that he had that one sequence where you're like, man, this was a badass fight with him. I would have to say that he has some, a little bit of the same issues as Batman is that 
they really haven't shown their prowess in fighting. And Wolverine is a is a is a is a fighter. He you know he can fight, but all you see him is doing is just slashing away with his claws and not really doing anything that's really impressive or that shows that he can fight. You know, all the all, the, the the same thing that we keep seeing every every time is that he gets hurt and he heals himself. Yeah. Right. They his, all, yeah. His yeah. best fights are in the in the old animated series, to be quite honest. Like, yeah. It, we ruled that out, but that's where he's depicted. All right. So I'm left with my number one. See, yes. I, you felt this way about the Battle of New York. I felt a little cheesy about my number one. So my number one was from Endgame. It's it's Iron Man Thor cap against Thanos. And I'm a little biased oh, yeah, 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 because yeah, yeah, I felt yeah. like I felt like after you know 12 years basically, it's so hard to stick the landing. And this to me was the scene that stuck the landing because you've got the connectivity of these original three guys who we spent a decade with, with no backdrop, no distractions. And you see them use max out their individual powers. You see them team up. Yeah. You see Thanos beat the daylights out of all of them, which is yeah. awesome. You see Thanos do some super cool stuff. When he intercepts Stormbreaker, that is actually even, that, I think that's an underrated, super cool moment in this where you're yeah. like, ooh, this guy can do things that <laughs> nobody else can do. But then you also get the iconic lifting of the hammer. And I couldn't get past that because it was such a moment from the comics and they had hinted at it in Ultron yeah. and to see them pay it off here followed by him then kind of, you know, almost helicoptering into him and a few real sort of heroic shots. But then it, you know, it ends with Avengers Assemble too. It ends with them coming through the portal. And set. to me, it was like, I don't know, after 12 years, I was like, I don't think I could ask for anything more from this franchise. And I know the final battle is what it is, but to me, that's like the secondary yeah. piece. Of this. That, this was the primary piece. And yeah. to me, it was like everything I wanted from comic book adaptation in like five minutes. From the moment... They stepped out, they saw Thanos sitting there till, you know, they finally got everybody coming back and they do the whole fight sequence. But that, that, that moment, that space where they're fighting Thanos, all three of them, I mean, when Cap gets the hammer and rains down lightning on him and hits it. It's, and I got to say, the other thing that really stuck in my mind was because Black Widow had gone out in this movie and there were so many, people forget, there were so many rumors leading up to this movie about one of these three, especially Cap or Tony getting it in this movie. That in this scene, unlike a lot of the other scenes, I had doubt that they were all gonna make it. Like that's the other thing is that because the rumor mill was working and you knew not all of them were gonna continue. Yeah. Most of the films you kind of know somehow, some way the hero's gonna make it. Somehow, yeah. some way he's gonna figure it out. Yeah. In this one, it was like, yeah, they're going to get Thanos, but he might take one of these guys with him. And that was yeah, also yeah, part yeah. of the scene that made the stakes just a little bit higher. higher yeah. yeah. This, I have to, I, I came up with see, I have some honorable benches, but I just didn't think that this would probably make it. But it's in the elevator scene, right? Not, not that so much, but this was a short sequence. And that is when he escapes the facility, the uh, shield facility, and is him against the plane. Oh yeah, yeah. Yo, that sequence was just to me perhaps the best heroic sequence. When he jumps off the plane, oh, he, he lands, lands and, and then he, and, yo, that to me that that's just like. You can't you can't top that for me. That's hard to top. It should have been my number one, but I didn't know if that counted because he wasn't fighting. I think that would be like a set piece. Yeah, that battle's that, more of a set piece. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that was that was a, a, a heroic, iconic moment of Captain America by himself taking out a plane and just doing it with just like not with ease, but with calculation and just just doing. Thinking, making it up as he goes along. I'm gonna do this. Boom! Throws the seal, comes back to him. He jumps off and lands, and he looks like when he, it's a small shot. It's like a split second, but it's like he looks, and then he's off to, and he's off again. But uh, that to me is one of the best heroic sequences of of, of superhero film. And listen, Tom Holland. <sighs> 
It's like, now it's like when I go watch it and if it doesn't give me any type of reaction, I'm going to be like, I'm going to be like, man, stop talking, you know, talk saying that this is the best it's going to, because you, you, you're bringing up people's expectations of something amazing and it may not live up to those, some of the things that we've talked about with Avengers and like one of the things that didn't make it on my list is when Thor makes his um, appearance back after he gets after he gets Stormbreaker and he comes to Wakanda. That's a dope moment. Yeah, that's a good call. I, you know, it's funny. I, I yeah, it's funny you say that because I almost was I was kind of dismissive of the Battle of Wakanda. It's just not the style of, as you know, I don't love the whole mass yeah, attack of yeah. the bad guys. But you're right that that one sequence with the music and the way he kind of you know screams for Thanos is 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 hot that's so that's a good that, that's that's that was dope that's another iconic moment of thor like the god of thunder and then and, and, and the clouds when he jumps and his eyes light up and he slams and it's just you know those are the moments where you say like damn marvel is freaking killing it yeah so, so it's funny like neither one of us had iron man versus or hulk buster versus hulk which is a popular one neither one of us had that even in the top 10 or not in my top 10 not in your top five yeah neither one of us it, neither cap one of us soldier. picked a fight what's that cap and winter soldier against no, uh, I was gonna say, uh civil iron war. man neither one of us picked a uh. civil war fight which i think is right they're, they're, it's, they're good but they're not i don't think any of those is quite at the level of the one like the winter soldier fights are better i think yeah, than, yeah, yeah. than than that even the like the end fight with tony and and steve i, I just yeah it's not quite there for me yeah, it's good yeah. but it's not quite there in fact i probably would argue for i kind of like the when it's him and bucky in the in the the apartment and they're kind of going through all those dudes yeah that i was i was yeah i was thinking about than, that yeah yeah and then black panther shows up at the end of that yeah. fight um but yeah we didn't pick anything from there you mentioned Thor. There's really no define. Like I would actually argue, there's no defining Thor. The, the Wakanda moment is his moment. I would say yeah. in his own movies, I don't think we've seen a truly amazing Thor fight. Um, that opening sequence uh, is is probably a little good. It's probably well done too with Thor when he fights. Um, when he gets out of. Uh, oh, Jotunheim, you mean? No, in in Thor Ragnarok, the beginning, the opening sequence. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was a little dope. I like that uh, that sequence, but I, you know, it was definitely didn't make um, my top five. Or you know, I don't even think about it. But I was thinking about the Thor sequences, that was one of the ones that were most that was most memorable to me. Um, yeah. What did we miss, people on the comic section? What did yeah, we miss? Let us, did yeah, let, yeah, let us know what are your top yeah. five moments and list them don't go crazy writing a whole just give us top five this scene this scene this scene this scene I, i'm interested in seeing uh or, or, and reading uh what are your top five moments let us know in the comment section below uh that is our show for today um thank you once again for um subscribing and hitting that notification bell hitting that like button we really do appreciate it uh, a lot of news this week, a lot of exciting things to talk about. Um, we still, again, another week and no Shang-Chi news. Um, let's see how long that lasts. Um, next week, we get WandaVision number nine. Looking forward to seeing what transpires there, how it ends, what the cutscene is going to be. Is it going to be Mephisto? Um, and then after that, we get uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, right? Yeah, it's March 19th. 18th. So we get like a we get like a couple weeks off and then it's Snyder Cut and Winter Soldier are the same uh same weekend. Yeah, so that's gonna be a hell of a weekend right there. Um, but thank you once again for joining us. Brian, any last words? No, but I would tell everyone, and you said it before, read read the variety article about the Snyder yeah. Cut. It is it is long, but it is well worth your time. Yeah, I was reading it and I was like, wow, this is, let me keep reading, let me keep reading. I, I usually like when I start reading like the first page, I start scrolling up to see how, <laughs> yo, I'm, I'll be, and then they're like, yo, this is a long ass article, but I read it and it was, and, I, and I'm glad I did read it because I got a lot of perspective. I want Zack Snyder to win, at least go out on his own terms and not the way, um, it went, he went out last time with, you know, people thinking that this Justice League was his film and it wasn't, it wasn't his film. 
It was Warner Brothers film. Warner Brothers hired Josh Whedon to do a job. He did it and he left. He changed a bunch of things that Zack Snyder, um, uh, you know, didn't approve. He wasn't behind none of it. It was all Warner Brothers. Um, and it's crazy. Like, I think some of the, after seeing some of the the, the stuff that Josh Whedon, oh, there, there was this one thing in the article that he mentioned that first, that Batman sequence on the rooftop. He said, yo, it was horrible. When I first saw it in the theater, like, yo, this was horrible. That was a badass scene, you know? And I'm talking about bad, like, literally, not slang. It was horrible. That was a bad, poor, the, 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 the robber was like, what did he say? He said something dumb, and, and it, he hasn't gotten a job since. And he's an actor. He's, he's been in a, quite a <clears throat> few things before. I haven't seen him in anything since after this. Well, even, even apparently, even Warner Brothers knew that knew that it was trash because the quote from the executive is like, "We're, we're dead." Like basically, it's horrible. <laughs> it's crazy, and it's like you put you. But hey, now March eighteenth, we get to see what he intended to see, and whether we like it or not, is is totally totally irrelevant. Um, he gets to show his movie. My random note that I, is. I can't get over it that Deborah Snyder has seen the theatrical cut and he hasn't, and she won't tell him anything about it. That woman must have a vault. Because like he's going through this whole editing process and she's a producer on the film, so she knows the full comparative of what he's putting together versus yeah. what we already saw, and she won't tell him anything. She's yeah. like, don't see this movie, won't tell him about it, but she saw it. I think yeah. that's, that's, that's pretty <laughs> impressive. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'll be tough not to like, it's like to keep it under wraps and not say anything oh, all, yeah. all this time. It's like, I, they're married. Like, yeah, yeah that's yeah. hard. Like, yeah, it's, it's definitely difficult. But, you know, it's like, I think it's more, and there's also, you know, respect for him and what he's yeah. gone through with this. And it's like, yo, I'm not going to even mention all this because it was garbage. And I know he's going to do a better job. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to March 18th. Um, but thank you once again for joining us in the Nerd Gen Report. We really do appreciate it. And we'll see you next week with more news. Uh, thank you once again. Good night.